Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us at AECOM. We are here today to talk about um, technology. We know that technology is playing a great, great um, place in the future in terms of what we're planning, buildings, um, you know, technology equals equipment these days and equipment is being, becoming redundant because technology is leading where we're going. But how do we plan for that in a world where technology is leading but and everybody wants the fanciest, danciest things that are out there and we're building facilities and we're spending money um, on doing that but is it really the right thing for what the climate is saying that we're, that, that the climate is saying what the needs are and you know let's get a clinical perspective on on really some of the big ticket items that are out there that people are looking for that might not be the right thing in the long run and here we are spending the money so we're talking about the rationalization of technology into healthcare and planning for the future and to help us do that um, this morning uh, we have um, Christine Stead who is an executive strategist at Blue Cottage Consulting and we have Andrew Lobla who is the a radiation oncologist, a clinical scientist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Um, Christine's going to talk to us about what the future looks like um, for healthcare, and Andrew's going to bring it down to what we're really doing and what we should be doing with some of the things that are out there and, and looking attractive for us and, and really how we should bring that down to a business case. Um, always considering the patient, of course, but what is the business behind our technology decisions? So on that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what's coming up in the future. Thanks, Christine. Um, I appreciate that introduction very much. It's an exciting topic uh, for sure, and I think to set the stage adequately, it's hard to talk about technology without also talking about value. And as we consider what the future holds, there's more and more uh, pressure and focus to uh, start thinking about value and trade-offs and how do, we, how do we spend more and more limited resources on healthcare um, in the highest value sort of way. So I wanted to um, point to a couple things that we look at when we think about how do we pick the winners for technology, what's worth investing in, and how do we guide our, our market and our clients accordingly. Um, I'm going to share a slide with you just to try to make that point about um, value when we look at uh, outcomes. Um, in the United States, when we look at some of the um, top nations, OECD nations, measuring quality, efficiency, and equity of care access to care and healthy lives. The U.S., while being the, the largest spender, also unfortunately has the worst outcomes when you look at uh, that kind of value. And so overall it really starts to force the question about are we spending our, our money and investing in technology adequately. Um, and of course the spending trends as we look over the past, well since 1960 to 2010, the United States continues to spend more they're not really achieving the outcomes um, even with some of the best technology arguably um, available to them. So we start to look now at how do we start to put healthcare technology in a good context and uh, Michael Porter and Tom Lee wrote a nice article in uh, the Harvard Business Review in October of 2013 that, that I think s says nicely um, a little bit about technology but also value and in short failure to improve value means well failure so we need to start looking at these things with a slightly different lens when we start thinking about picking winners and, and weeding out losers there's a bit of a grid that you can put some of these things in and, and the answer uh, for you as an organization or you as a provider um, may differ depending on who you are but it is important to maybe start thinking about effectiveness of the technology that you're evaluating with um, the cost that it, that it takes to implement that technology and not just implement but kind of a total cost perspective, operate, train staff, etc. to use it effectively. So when we look at this grid, um, the best value technologies would fall in this upper right hand quadrant of low cost and high effectiveness. 
just to kind of bring in a few different examples of some of the medical technology that's out there, obviously proton beam accelerators certainly are north of $100 million plus um, per proton beam accelerator, so that's a, a very expensive um, piece of technology and how who should purchase that and how that should be applied really is um, something that you have to ask and make a good case for if you're going to go down that path. And then there's a few different examples here um, of other instruments or technologies that are used in diagnostic and treatment type roles. But the other one I want to highlight is electronic health records, which is a technology in and of itself, not a small investment either. Um, so how do we pick our winners and pick our losers? If we look just a little bit at um, a comparative analysis of a proton beam accelerator, a da Vinci robot, and a 320 slice CT scanner, these, these are the kinds of choices sometimes people have to make as a healthcare organization, what to invest limited resources in. And often it comes to what kind of role you want to play in the market. Is there a access to a proton beam accelerator nearby or in a region, and if so, how's that being used elsewhere? Do you want to use that as a competitive advantage? Um, and I think uh, Dr. Lavla will talk a little bit more about this particular technology later, about how he sees the application of it and the effectiveness and outcome. Um, but it's an important example because of the expensive uh, nature of that technology, that when you think of how it's applied and what kind of return on investment that that you'll achieve as an organization or that patients will achieve in terms of outcomes, it's a difficult case to make and certainly um, not one to, to uh, be walked down lightly. Da Vinci Robot, while less, substantively less, um, similarly requires a substantive amount of not just funds but also designated space within a hospital facility. These uh, surgical suites usually require a little bit more space. Um, the training for your surgical team uh, also needs to be invested and maintained to do uh, this well. The benefits to the patients, of course, are reduced length of stay, but their OR time often can be longer. Um, and then the 320 slice CT scanner is not exactly best practice yet for most um, kinds of clinical applications like cardiac um, cath doing some uh, diagnostic cardiac scans or those kinds of replacement technologies. Part of it is due to cost, part of it's due to um, radiation exposure, which of course there's substantively more when you use this kind of technology and the benefits haven't quite outweighed the cost for most people yet. And then when we look ahead about where healthcare is going, um, it's hard to not think about the kinds of consumer directed um, applications that technology also allows for. Um, Apple introduced a health kit just uh, this past year that allows consumers to really track and coordinate many of the components of their own health records as well as some of their lifestyle habits, nutrition, sleep, um, exercise, etc. into one um, fairly easy to look at and easy to track tool that they can access anytime on their iPhone. Um, that's going to become increasingly important at least in the US for sure but certainly in other markets where patients and, and consumers are obligated more and more directly to pay for some or all of their care. Um, and so this Castlight application, which is shown just a little bit to the right of the um, Apple Health Kit one, gives an example of the kind of comparative cost shopping that consumers can do as well uh, through this kind of application. And certainly others will be developed over time. But it does make us all have to question how we define value and who's defining that value. I think in the future of healthcare, more and more patients will be defining value based on the outcomes and, and the perceived effectiveness for themselves about what they're going to embark on purchasing. So there's certainly a partnership with their physicians and their providers, but more and more they'll be choosing as they're paying. And when we think about how do we find the best value for the technology we need to purchase and stay ahead of the game, uh, we have this little health illness continuum in this graphic where um, we believe winners will go up the bar a little bit more to help patients stay healthier or catch them before they become really ill. And uh, that's where we think not just patients but also health systems 
will find a lot of value uh, just in how they they look at um, purchasing technology and thinking about uh, what what is best for their system, the patients that they have, and the, and frankly the consumers. So um, this conversation about uh, value and technology and picking winners and losers can look differently depending on the screen or the filter with which you're looking at it and who you are. If you're a regional academic medical center, it may make sense for you to purchase some of the more expensive uh, niche quaternary uh, type care level technology, but it will not make sense if you're a community provider unless you're a very large uh, hospital system that's part of a larger network of, of care. And I think we all need to be mindful that consumers will be driving a lot more of um, what they perceive as value. So cost comparative analyses will be tools that are available easily for people. And if we're not thinking about that and getting ahead of that in how we think about technology and what's valuable to people, it will be difficult to be competitive and uh, forward thinking. So that's kind of setting a little bit of the stage. And I know Dr. Lavla will, will do a wonderful job taking us through a specific example um, in a clinical application. Well, thanks, Christine. Um, I think it's true, too, that um, all over the world, not only in the U.S., we see that there's always limited dollars. I've never had a project in the world where it's unlimited and you can just buy what you want. So rationalization in terms of who the client is, what their needs really are clinically is really essential. And I think it's something that's really lost in, in a lot of the projects that we do. Um, so um, Dr. Lavla, we're going to turn it over for you to you for your provocative talk on, uh, on uh, technology. Great. Thanks both, Christine. Um, so I'll just preface by saying that I'm a clinician, uh, researcher, and um, scientist here at Sunnybrook Hospital, and all I do is treat prostate cancer. So we're going to pick up a little bit on the value theme and the rationalization theme that both Christine's had talked about, and sort of look deeply into prostate cancer to see whether or see how this will actually play out. I completely agree that the future will be consumer driven. Uh, patients will be enabled to choose their provider and choose the kind of care path they want that makes most sense for them. And the analogy I use is it's kind of like buying a, a nice suit. Like there are certain suits that fit, fit men um, who are tall and lanky and there are certain suits that fit men who are shorter and more muscular and one size does not fit all. And I think we need to respond to that as healthcare providers. So we're gonna go through, I'm gonna share, see if this works. I'm gonna Share my screen, share, and bear with me for a moment. Let's see if this. There. Is that working, Christine? Yes. Great. So in Canada, rationalization is a bit of a dirty word. So let's let's think about, uh, or at least the way I like to think about it, is, is it's actually being a little bit smarter about um, choosing our technology that's going to give us the best patient outcomes um, for the lowest cost. And at least we can start to rank. And uh, like uh, Christine said, had said, if you're an academic health sciences center, you may very well decide that spending a little bit more on a product that positions you as the leading academic health center might make perfect sense. But you have to be able to get a sense or a list or a litany, if you will, of these different healthcare interventions. And, and you can do this for every different health state. Um, we're talking about, we'll, we'll look a little bit into prostate cancer now. So radiation treatment has changed dramatically over my uh, training. Uh, when I first started 20 years ago, when we give external beam radiotherapy, which is the most commonly used treatment for prostate cancer, about 50% of patients actually uh, recurred after treatment, which is now not acceptable. Um, this is a uh, data from the MRC study, which uh, randomized patients between six and a half weeks, which was the standard when I started training t uh, 20 years ago, versus an additional week of radiotherapy. And you can see we've actually pushed the curve up. This is the chance of being cancer-free out to 10 years. And so we are moving in the right direction from 43% chance of control to 57%. And if your uh, prostate cancer is controlled using the PSA blood test at 10 years, most experts believe that that's a surrogate for cure. So there's a different type of radiation treatment called brachytherapy. Brachytherapy involves putting seeds inside the prostate 
generally when the patient's asleep or definitely when the patient's anesthetized. And on the left side of the screen, you can see how brachytherapy, or in this, uh, the acronym used here is per permanent perineal implantation, compared to our six and a half week course of treatment. You can see there's a huge difference in terms of PSA control uh, going out to eight years, and this is highly statistically significant. So recall from the MRC study that more dose is better. So how does brachytherapy compare to um, modern radiotherapy or these higher doses? So in the memorial series, which is the one on the right, you can see that we still get better outcomes as you expect from the MRC study, but brachytherapy is still the winner, offering about uh, twice as good control uh, going up to eight years. Um, so I actually went back and and modeled what the outcomes would have been in the MRC study if they had actually used brachytherapy as a standalone or as a boost treatment. And we would have gone from 57% control to 92% control. And the beautiful thing about brachytherapy is it's actually very, very cheap to deliver. Um, and we can extend this a little bit further. This will be about a little bit. Um, there's a new form of radiotherapy called stereotactic treatment. And if you look at the middle box, um, which is the intermediate risk group of patients and the high risk group of patients, with the low risk, we believe that those patients should be watched. There are estimates by Alice Dragomar that suggest in Canada, watching patients with low risk disease can save $100 million per year with no downsides in terms of cancer recurrence. So that's the smart move in that regard. No treatment is the best treatment for no side effects. For those patients who do need treatment in these latter two boxes, you can see that now, even compared to robotic surgery, that radiotherapy uh, with stereotactic treatment or with brachytherapy is getting better. So here's the radical prostatectomy series at Princess Margaret Hospital. This is both open and prostatectomy, 59% chance of control. So that's very similar. And th this is a five-year milestone, I should say, not 10 years. Stereotactic radiation, 93%. Low dose rate brachytherapy, 97%. High dose rate, 98%. So you can see that we're getting better controls, but it's actually encouraging to us that it actually costs less. So we did a, a little bit of a deep dive in our center, uh, comparing these different treatment approaches, and you can see that all of them basically stack up pretty similarly in terms of cancer control long term, but you can see the differences in costs are, are, are vast. Uh, stereotactic radiation treatment is a uh, weekly treatment times five, um, and it costs about $1,400 using our older technology. Um, LDR brachytherapy is about twice that, but still very cost effective, and our standard external beam is, not, is about $7,000 per course, and this is, this is the actual cost. Not a reimbursement rate, not a charge. We need to distinguish between those three. Compare proton facilities in the U.S. where Medicare reimbursement rates are about $60,000 and the private system $160,000. So it's really hard to, to actually justify using this perspective or lens how spending $160,000 is better than spending $1,400 for patients. And I think that's part of the conversation that we will have going forward. The very exciting slash frustrating part about what I do is that things are constantly changing. So as I mentioned, on the left here, we have the standard uh, three uh, seven-week course of radiotherapy. And normally when we give radiation treatment externally, we need to take into account um, any uh, wiggling the patient does while he's on the treatment table. No man will stay still for any period of time. So we need to take that into account. And then as prostate actually moves as his bladder fills, I hear snickering in the background, uh, as the bladder fills and the, bla and the, and the bowels fill up, um, as well with his respiration. So that movement needs to, take into, to be taken into consideration. So on the left, we have about a 7 to 10 millimeter margin to take those organ motions into account. With our five treatment approach, um, we actually put three little gold seed markers. I don't know if you can see them very well, but these little white dots in the prostate, they allow us to lock on target, kind of like in the Gulf War where we had these laser-guided missiles. We now have laser-guided radiation treatment. And so by doing that, we can cut down the rim of normal tissue exposed to radiation by half, down to five millimeters. And then the Christmas future, if you will, or the radiation future is the one on the right, where we can actually deliver doses uh, uh, even faster than before and can get the treatment uncertainty margin down to three millimeters. The pundit would say, well, who cares? This is just technology for technology's sake.
but what's important is that we are actually giving um, historically we were giving 78 grave radiotherapy but with these newer techniques we're giving 30 percent higher dose the analogy I use to patients this is more bullets in the gun if you've got a hundred guys coming at you and you got a hundred bullets in your gun you may kill them all but you may not you miss, may miss one or two if they give you 200 bullets you have a much better chance of killing the guys coming at you it's the same with cancer control the number the amount of bullets that hit the normal tissues are also important so we're getting seven and a half weeks to the rectum for the normal tissues, we're actually exposing the body to less or new image of a body, which means less side effects. And uh, this is uh, basically dependent on two things, which is, first of all, the dose that's being exposed, so it's a lower dose, but more importantly, the volume of tissue that we're actually exposing is far less, 10 times less than our standard treatments. And you can see with our next generation treatment machines, uh, we can get these treatments down to about three to six minutes in length. And you know when you, you're paying four therapists to sit on the machine, that's what drives your costs. And so we can get these two treatment approach down to six hundred and fifty dollars, uh, which is even better than the stereotactic approach we looked at before. So here's the basic paradigm shift going forward. So any man in North America or anywhere in the world really has a choice. He can go to a place like um, this outpatient care center, which I believe is in, um, in Kansas City for protons. He'll have to uh, pay $160,000 from his insurance. Maybe he has a 30% copay, which means he's paying, or a 25% copay. So he's he's paying out of his pocket $30,000. He's got to uproot himself from wherever he is. Maybe he lives in Ohio or Chicago or whatever, and he needs to live in Kansas City for eight weeks, which is great if you're a Kansas City fan. Um, but here's the alternative. Let's use that two-fraction stereotactic approach non-invasive treatment. Let's take the man and his family, let's take him down to the Bahamas, put him up in a really nice hotel, do true treatments over one week, and we'll pay for the whole thing by his insurance company. The patient maybe has to pay a couple uh, $7,000 copay as per usual, but he's paying less money, he's getting a nice vacation, and we're actually getting better cure rates. This, in my mind, is a, is a move in the right direction. Um, we can actually, uh, we've been talking about um, treatment for localized prostate cancer, but some men are unfortunate to have their cancer spread after treatment or who present with what's called metastatic disease. And this slide just basically summarizes, if we actually go after the metastatic disease, we can actually uh, reduce the chance of that cancer killing the man in, in the future. And, and so the survival long term is in the 30 to 40 percent range. So it's not 100 percent if we were aggressive about our treatment. And this is something straight out of prostate cancer. Uh, the box I've illustrated here, if we are actually aggressive about the treatment to the metastasis, and that's surgical or radiation, um, we can actually reduce the risk of prostate cancer death by 76%. So why is that important? Well, it's important for the man, obviously, and his family and those who love him, but we also have to think about the costs. Um, preventing men from going into a metastatic state or, or halting the disease when it's in the metastatic state can save a whole boatload of money. It's very exciting for prostate cancer researchers and for patients. We have all these different treatments that in the last two years have received Health Canada and FDA approval. The problem with these things is each of them adds a, a little bit more life and improves the quality of life a little bit and these are fantastic outcomes but they, they come at a cost and the cost if you add up all these treatments is $260,000. So compare that to the charge in the US for stereotactic radiotherapy at 25, you can see that stereotactic radiation, in other words these new technologies, are on the right side of that decision balance for the patient and I'm not saying it's one or the other, sometimes you might need both, but maybe using technologies that are cheaper to deliver once they're installed uh, may make better sense than just uh, throwing more and more drugs at the problem. And this is very similar to the Commonwealth curve I think that uh, Christina showed you, and this is a very simple litmus test in my mind. Is, you know, if I said, look, you're living in Los Angeles and you need to get to New York, who can tell me how to get there you know, road by road? Probably not many people unless they had a GPS could tell you. But basically, people would probably understand the concept that if you continue to go east and you continue to go north a little bit, then you're heading in the right direction. And that's the same thing in the healthcare system. So if we think of whatever technology we're using and put it at the middle of this box, if we actually can reduce costs and improve outcomes, we should do more of that and not go back. So external beam radiotherapy, in my mind, should be replaced 
by brachytherapy or stereotactic treatment. If you have a treatment like robotic surgery, like Christine talked about, that actually maybe has the same patient outcomes, arguably in high volume centers, it's a little bit better, um, but it actually costs more and actually takes more operating time, we should stop or either do less of this. We should actually restrict those technologies. And as long as we have this paradigm of moving towards our goal, which is lower cost, better patient outcomes, then at least we can be rational about how we actually uh, can choose treatments. Now, there will be treatments at some point that will be better for patients, but cost a little bit more. And then we can figure out together how to what the best trade-off is, what's the acceptable bang for the buck, and whether that's cost per quality or whatever it is, I think the patient focus has to be integrated into that going forward. Um, but we can work on that together. Um, and uh, so that kind of puts a perspective from the guy in the trench, if you will, um, you know, implementing these seductive technologies. It's very easy to say, give me the latest robot, give me the, the best proton machines. But I think going forward, we're all going to win if we actually can keep the healthcare costs down and actually make the patient experience better. Christine? Wow, that certainly is convincing to me. <laughs> it's going to be convincing, you know, and talking about the issues with our with our clients around the world that really, you know, think that we've got to get that proton beam therapy, we got to get this, we got to get this. So how do you convince the world that that we really need to do these studies and make the value analysis instead of them just going forward? That's the question. And, and I think that there are situations where proton beam makes a lot of sense, like in pediatric tumors and some head and neck tumors, they have actually shown that there is actually uh, the cost per quality adjusted life year is actually way better with protons. The problem is that most people keep the proton facilities open with prostate cancer, and that's probably not the right uh, perspective. Um, but, you know, I think by having these conversations, we can be rational about these things and, and talk on the same page about what it is we want for our clients. That's great. Christine, anything to add before we close? I think this has been really, um, I think we're bringing together some good perspectives. The only thing that's always a challenge is that whenever there is new technology, you often have to establish the case um, for that. And that takes time and it's usually a little bit more expensive out of the gate. So uh, we have that curve, I think uh, cabbage uh, heart bypass surgery is one of you know, a classic example where it's fairly common now for most even community hospitals to provide that kind of procedure. And when it first was introduced into the market, obviously this was done at just a few centers um, that were more regional medical centers. Um, and it was very expensive until people learned a lot about how to do it well, how to um, reduce that length of stay, improve patient outcomes, have patients with, uh, you know, leaving the hospital much sooner. So it can work and can be done, but I think we need to be really thoughtful about how many experiments we're running at the same time. And if we have some of our best um, clinicians and scientists working together to prove or disprove the value of technology, that might be a better approach for introducing new things into the market to just see uh, what their potential really is before we just kind of unleash it into the market in general. And then, Christian, I completely agree with you. I think that's the real role of an academic health sciences center is to take those, they're the research hubs. They're the places that take, either um, develop the product or the early adopters. They're the ones that actually evaluate those technologies uh, mm -hmm. prospectively in clinical trials before it's, it's rolled out widespread. Um, the unfortunate story, I think, with the Da Vinci robot is it, because of a, I think, a very popular and a very successful marketing machine, it rolled out across without actually some evaluation. I think I think that's where we got a bit a bit, is that we were seduced by the technology before we evaluated it properly. So I, I actually see that Academic Health Sciences Center and maybe the private payers are the ones that should incubate these technologies, mm -hmm. evaluate them properly, but be, um, I would say forced, but encouraged to share that experiences with others so that if it looks like it's interesting and valuable to public payers, then we should actually integrate it at that stage. That's, that's my own personal philosophy on that. I think the one thing that we see too is, um, you know, there's the capital cost and there's the building cost, but everybody always forgets about training. You know, um, we have to train people to use this technology and we've seen many facilities throughout the world where technology has been put in and there's been no staff to run the, the facility um, and uh, that has to be part of the whole equation. Absolutely. And then sometimes, depending on the technology, 
that can actually be your rate limiting step, right? right. Maybe you need a, a physicist, a PhD physicist to run your new proton facility, um, but they don't exist in that country. So, you know, you could spend a lot of money, but, you know, growing highly trained uh, specialists takes 10 years, and it's not easy to do that. So these are things we all need to consider when, when moving these things forward. Mm -hmm. Definitely an interesting discussion, and um, thank you both for uh, joining us. We um, had fun when we did our talk at the International Academy of Design and Health, and this has been just as fun and provocative and thought thought-provoking in terms of how do we use this and how do we make this a standard for, for all the work that we do and going forward. Thank you both. It's a Thank pleasure, you. Christine. Nice, nice working with you both. Thank you. Thank you.